Welcome back. Finishing up on that political generations uh, discussion that uh, I was giving you in the last mini lecture. One of the reasons I believe that younger Germans both resent, in many cases, older Germans, but particularly the United States, is the belief that they were too materially oriented, that they were shallow and materialistic. And a lot of younger Germans perceive older Germans as having modeled their politics, their values, their lifestyle on the American model. Roskin points out that many younger Germans have adopted this notion that that modern culture needs to move beyond getting and spending, we need to get beyond being a consumer culture. And uh, this is called post-materialism. And uh, Roskin uh, makes the claim that this partially explains why political parties such as the Greens and the left have become increasingly popular with younger voters. And if you look at the practical aspects of that, what we have seen is the transformation of German politics from what I call the traditional three-party system, which remember were the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats, and the Free Democrats, to a very thriving multi-party system where if you take a look at the Bundestag today in 2020, there are six political parties represented uh, in the Bundestag. I, I think this is also further evidence uh, for Roskin's claim that there is a German de-alignment in the electorate, that uh, a lot of uh, Germans have given up on the big two parties and are increasingly looking at alternative parties. Now, some people believe that this is a realignment of the electorate. Uh, remember, that's where increasingly large numbers of people transfer their political loyalty from one party to another. Uh, but I don't see that because I don't see uh, a large migration from one particular party to the other. I mean, if you want to look uh, at realignments of electorates, for example, in America, you take a look at what the Great Depression did. Uh, the Great Depression uh, was a dramatic event, and a lot of former Republicans gave up on their party and became Democrats, and then the Democrats became the majority party uh, after uh, the Great Depression. Same thing happened with the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the Democrats had been the majority party for a long period of time, a large number of Democrats gave up on their party and became Republicans. And we saw Republican dominance in American party from 1860 to 1932. So I don't see a realignment in terms of establishing a new political party dominance. Uh, I think the German uh, example is a better case study uh, of dealignment. Roskin makes a few other observations that I would just point out to you in this last lecture. Uh, the notion that Germans have a split personality. Uh, I have some stars there. The tendency of Germans to hearken back to an ideal world or mythical past is called romanticism. But on the other hand, <coughs> while there is that element uh, of idealism, there is no question that Germans are very realistic. They're very hardworking. Uh, they're driven by achievement. And certainly you see that as you read through the chapter. Uh, Germany has a very highly stratified school system. The attempt of the Germans are to skim off the best and the brightest and pretty much leave uh, other people behind. We certainly saw that in the example of both the British and the French. This notion of having the best and the brightest reflected in leadership uh, is seen in Angela Merkel's cabinet today. Uh, Eleven members. Uh, of Merkel's cabinet today have PhDs. Uh, like in Britain, uh, if you take a look at the Bundestag, uh, you see seasoned party loyalists and the way uh, that you rise through the political ladder is through apprenticeship uh, and serving your time. And in fact, uh, German legislators uh, tend to be even older and more seasoned uh, than those in Great Britain. In terms of interest group linkages, it's very typical uh, to what I've discussed uh, in other countries. Uh, German labor is much more unionized 
than in the United States, uh, about 20 uh, to 22 percent, depending on the source uh, of German labor is unionized. It's less than 12 percent in the United States. So German labor uh, is about twice as unionized as in the United States. Uh, German uh, labor slightly less unionized than Britain, but more than triple uh, that in France. Uh, as uh, I discussed when talking about Britain and France, uh, labor unions tend to be a major supporter of parties uh, up the left, and we see this in Germany. Uh, you should know, uh, yellow highlight this or star this, I forgot to, uh, about a third of SPD, that would be the Social Democratic Deputies, have union ties, uh, and the largest labor union, the DGB, is closely linked to the Social Democrats, which is what you would expect. You would also expect that the uh, business interests in Germany, in this case, the Federation of German Industries, or the BDI, has a very close relationship to the major mainstream party of the right, which is the Christian Democratic Union and its ally, the Christian Socialists that exist in Bavaria, which remember uh, both Roskin and I uh, have referred to as the Texas of Germany. Uh, if you look at German public policy and loose ends, uh, I believe uh, that if you take a look at German federalism, there are good and there are bad things uh, attached, uh, but I personally believe that federalism uh, is generally positive uh, in the German case. Uh, I believe that German federalism is appropriate given its history uh, of regional diversity, and it really does, uh, I think, in many ways allow for those dual splits that uh, exist in Germany. Uh, that traditional north-south split that is largely a religious demarcation with uh, uh, Protestant uh, states in the northern part of Germany uh, and Catholic states in the southern part of Germany. Uh, you also uh, tend to have a uh, more leftist uh, base in the six eastern states, uh, and the western states tend to be uh, a bit more mainstream, and some would even say. Uh, conservative. And so you have an east-west split, you have a north-south split. Federalism allows those 16 states uh, to have a lot of autonomy uh, and a lot of power. And one of the things that I think we all need to realize uh, is that Germany has only been reunified uh, for 30 years, since 1990. And uh, uh, I uh, agree that this reunification uh, could not have come gradually. It occurred very, very quickly. Uh, federalism has allowed the integration of the six eastern states to occur uh, over time. And there's a, a, a typo in your notes. It says over time. It should say over time. Uh, boy, I'm going to have to get a better secretary, uh, obviously, in typing up these notes. Uh, the Germans have invested a lot of money in terms of redistribution. Uh, it slowed down in the last decade or so, but at one time, uh, the national government was uh, pumping in about 80 billion euros a year to try to modernize the eastern German states and bring them up to the modernization level uh, of the 10 states of the West. And I think they've done a very, very good job of that. When I take a look uh, at Germany, and I look at, you know, here is a country that is looked at monolithically in Europe. It's seen as the dominant economic state uh, in in Germany. Um, but Germany has some some structural issues, and the biggest structural issue that I see for Germany is what I would call the demographic uh, time bomb. Uh, as you know, I've talked about this. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of work in, in political demographics. It's an interest uh, that I have. Uh, uh, I did a two and a half year research project uh, looking at Soviet population policies, comparing uh, various uh, ways to 
attempt to increase fertility rates for Slavic women, uh, and it didn't work very successfully. And in Germany, uh, they've tried incentives to get German women to have uh, more children, uh, tax incentives, uh, increased parental uh, leave, both for moms uh, and dads. Uh, and yet, if you take a look at, at German population, the current uh, German fertility rate is only about 1.4. It's very, very low. Uh, 2.06, your book says 2.1, but technically 2.06 is replacement. Uh, and the result on the German population is dramatic. This is a country that has a very rapidly aging population. Uh, it is one of the oldest in the world. Uh, five years from now, in 2025, it's estimated that about one out of four people in Germany and one out of four people in Japan, 24%, uh, will be over 65 years of age. Uh, the problem from a public policy perspective of this uh, is that increasingly a greater and greater share or proportion of tax revenues is going to have to go for social spending. Already, right now, uh, a third of German gross domestic product is going for social spending, and that percentage will continue to increase as the population of the country continues to age. What that means is that fewer and fewer younger people are going to be economically supporting more and more older people. Now, one way to resolve this, and certainly uh, this is one thing that Merkel has tried to do uh, with a lot of political opposition, is try to promote greater immigration. If your own people are not producing enough new laborers, then an alternative to that is to have laborers come to your country. However, Roskin points out that the Germans have not reacted very well uh, to what Roskin calls the flood of foreigners, who in this case are primarily Turks, and in the last few years, Muslims from the Middle East and from North Africa. And when I discussed earlier about my great surprise in the last Bundestag election in 2017, where we see the rise of a nationalist, right-wing, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim party, uh, with significant representation in the Bundestag, uh, you, you certainly see the political repercussions of, of this. So uh, they're all ready for a couple of decades had been some resentment uh, directed at the Turkish population. On the other hand, there is a labor shortage in, in many parts of Germany. So Merkel takes a very relaxed stance towards immigration, uh, which intensifies that uh, animosity, and in this case, uh, a political backlash. Now, while there is no current threat to um, this issue destabilizing the political regime or even probably threatening Merkel's leadership, uh, certainly over time uh, this could become problematic. So uh, the Germans are going to have to decide, well, what do we do? Uh, we know that typically there is more money spent uh, in terms of health care expenses on a person's last year of life than the rest of the, er, their life combined. And if you have a population that is aging and aging rapidly, uh, this is going to put a lot of stress uh, in terms of the German welfare state, which is much more uh, comprehensive uh, than, than in the United States. You know, in the United States, we, we're talking about you know, can we afford national health care? Uh, in Germany, uh, there is a very comprehensive system that goes well beyond just national health care, uh, including leaves, tax incentives, etc. So uh, Germany is going to have to reconcile uh, this immigration issue. But to me, the biggest issue uh, is the issue of an aging population structure. Hope you enjoyed the course. Have a great